Thank you um, and welcome to, uh, for coming to the Center for Continuing Education's Notable Neighbors program. Notable Neighbors showcases accomplished community members and tonight I am so pleased to introduce Elizabeth Colbert, Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Sixth Extinction and much more importantly the daughter of Marlene and Jerry Colbert. and we, we uh, thank the entire family. Um, before I do the introductions, I wanted just to take a moment to say thank you. Uh, thank you especially to Betsy for volunteering her time tonight. Thank you to our business sponsors, Houlihan Lawrence and Ray Katine Alexis. And thank you to all of you for supporting the center. Our mission is to strengthen the community by offering opportunities that are local for intellectual engagement and social connection. We are a nonprofit, self-sustaining organization. We do not receive any support from the school district, nor do we receive any grants. So your attendance at an event like tonight and at our classes is very meaningful to us along with your support in our annual fundraising campaign, which was just sent out a few weeks ago. Uh, there are envelopes up in, uh, at the check-in desk uh, if you would want one. Um, your support in that way actually helps keep us um, growing and healthy. So thank you to all of you. So tonight, I am pleased to welcome Sophia Andrews uh, and Emma Chester. Um, 
So I, I can't really say it except that um, I, I guess I, I partly credit um, my parents because we used to go out west um, every couple of years and, and I think that had a big uh, impact on me to see part of the world that seemed um, still intact. I guess I know now somewhat better that even that was not exactly intact. Um, uh, but I don't. I don't really have a. I don't really have a, a sort of a eureka moment experience uh, that I can point to. I, I actually covered politics uh, for a really long time, which is sort of the opposite of covering uh, environments. Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, was there a point in your career where you could say you pivot toward writing uh, more about scientific works or uh, scientific principles? Yes, I, I went, when I went to the New Yorker, I, I worked at the New York Times for a long time, and I covered, um, I covered the state government and I covered national politics, which uh, can get you know pretty old, to be honest. Um, now we're having another corruption trial of someone in Albany, and I was there for the last round of corruption trials um, in Albany. So, I, I when I went to the New Yorker uh, in 1999, I, I actually was hired to cover politics, but I. Um, started looking around for, for, for other things to write about for, for a variety of reasons. And I um, actually went to Greenland in, um, I guess it was 2001 for the first time. And that um, made a really big impression on me. And that was a moment, actually that was the moment, was before many of uh, the students here were environmentally conscious, or perhaps even conscious, I have to do the math. Um, and where the US had just withdrawn from the Kyoto Protocol, um, and it seemed like uh, a big moment to me at the time, and I went looking for a story to write about, about climate change at a moment when um, there was still a lot of, you know, quote-unquote debate over, over whether this was really a big, an important subject or not. So then I need to ask, what became the inspiration to write this particular book? Because in reading The Sixth Extinction, it seemed to be a labor of love that there was a lot of very specific places that you went to, and it was uh, targeted for specific reasons. So where about did the book come from? Well, the book came from, in part, from the, from the previous book that I wrote, which um, was exclusively about climate change. And after I um, wrote that book, people started to come to me and with things you know that should have been in the book and one of those issues was um which i suspect you ap environmental studies or i hope you're studying um is ocean acidification which is sort of the flip side of climate change um and so so in a sense i realized that only the book that book had only covered one of the ways in which you know we were changing the planet on this sort of geological um, scale, and so that became one of the impetuses to look for a new a new book, a, a second book to look at these issues that hadn't been covered in the first book. And then actually, um, I went to Panama to do a story that's the first chapter of the book on, on frogs, on what's been being called the amphibian crisis, and and, and those two sort of strands. Uh, came together to, to form the, the, the current Yeah, so the book opens up with the uh, Panamanian frogs, and I found it very curious that um, you noted the story first in a nature magazine for your kids. Um, so what was it about that particular uh, note in terms of the amphibians that made you kind of start your book? Well, let's we'll start. I guess I, I should confess it's a it's a teeny bit of a fake there, um, but I yes, I, know it. I was uh, yeah a journalistic trick. Um, I I was actually look I was I heard about this amphibian you know die off, which is a, a, a very big deal, um, and I would, was looking for a way to write about it. Um, but hadn't really come up with anything, and I and this was a, a National Geographic Kids, and it was uh, the Frog Hotel. That was really was the inspiration, and I thought, well, that's just a great story. Um, you know, it's a great story for adults too, and uh, that really that really was the motivation. But it it it, it was something that was in the back of my mind how to write about it, and 
Then what actually happened also was, and, and people might remember it, and even some students might remember it, um, at roughly exactly the same time, um, news of a new fungal pathogen, an introduced pathogen, white nose syndrome, which is killing off bats, has killed off many millions of bats in the Northeast, um, and I'm sure right here in La Trone, um, so those two things sort of came together, and they were they were a very unfortunate you know, coincidence. Although I guess I would argue they're not really exactly a coincidence. Do you know um, of any current updates on that situation? I don't know if you get feedback about what's going on there, or with, with the bats. Uh, with the bats and with the frogs. Well, with the bats, um, there's a lot of uh, it's it's spreading. It's now. Um, it began as a, a, a pathogen that was probably introduced actually into a cave um, in upstate New York, so not very far from where we are right now. And uh, it has now spread, uh, the last I read it was in 22 states and um, five Canadian provinces. So it continues to spread and, um, you know, no one has a, there's no cure, there are many people looking at what to do, but once a, a, a fungus or a pathogen gets into the environment, and, and this is a, a fungus that can survive without the bats, the bats are there, it kills them, the bats aren't there, it still survives. Um, so that's a very sad and sort of desperate situation. But there are remnant populations, I mean, you'll still see bats around, and so maybe there's some resistant populations out there, that's sort of the hope. And, the same is true for um, chytrid, the chytrid fungus that's killing off frogs. M many species are probably extinct, or perhaps a couple hundred, um, but in, in a lot of cases there are remnant, spe remnant populations and maybe they have some resistance, so maybe uh, maybe the worst of that is over, but, but it's very hard to know. So I know a lot of this... Me, you can't hear me, okay. I, are you getting an echo though? Echo, echo or not loud enough, okay. That's the advantage sometimes of being a teacher, you have to shout, right kids? Right. Yeah. Um, so in speaking of the particular places that um, the book has cited, uh, a lot of the students are very curious as to who you know um, in terms of uh, how your access into getting to those locations, like who did you have to contact, um, how was it you were going to certain places? Was there any place that you wanted to go to and you couldn't? Because you went to some quite remote places and then you went to upstate New York. So it's interesting in terms of this, this spectrum of places. Right, well that, that's just one of the advantages of being a, a reporter is you just, um, you know, you call people up and in general I would say people were very, very generous to me and, you know, if they, um, were going somewhere and, you know, I wanted to go, they, they were generally very, very generous about taking me along. A, a, you know, a lot of it is happenstance. You might want to go somewhere, but the timing doesn't work, or, you know, funding is, uh, for you students interested in science, science funding is, is, is very difficult to get <laughs> these days. So, you know, sometimes people had projects that they didn't have any money for anymore, and so they were sort of, you know, winding down. So, uh, so some of it was timing, and some of it was luck, and some of it, but uh, but a lot of it is just calling people, and someone leads you to someone else who leads you to someone else. Is there any place you wanted to go to that you were unable to for whatever reason? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that the, um, you know, there are, there are missing, um, missing geographies in the book. You know, it would have been great to go to Indonesia, it would have been great to go to Africa, um, but I, you know, just picked, it, to a certain extent, things that were, people, you know, it, it, the, the itinerary was determined by the, the work that people were doing out in the field, and so, uh, for example, I went to Peru with a group of people who were studying um, how climate change was affecting, you know, how species were moving, uh, in relationship to climate change. And had I found someone in a different part of the world, I would have gone there, but that's the person that I found. Is there a place that has resonated more with you than others, or are there places that have haunted you more based upon uh, what you saw or what you bore witness to? 
Well, I, I, I've been asked that a, a bunch of times, and I, I usually say, and although I could say uh, um, there are several places that were just amazing, I think the place that really um, made the biggest impression on me was going to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I don't know if anyone here has been, but it is really an extraordinary place, and um, reefs are very, you know, endangered now, and to imagine this whole ecosystem uh, going out uh, is really um, very frightening and sobering. So I, I often do think of the time I spent on the Great Barrier Reef. That's, that's um, an experience that I think was very memorable. And one of the sort of ironies of, of the whole process of writing the book was that I, I got to go to really amazing places um, with really amazing people, uh, even, you know, as a lot of it was very, we, we were always looking for something, you know, pretty, pretty depressing, um, but the actual experience of being out there was really quite wonderful. Um, was it hard for you at times, uh, being that you know, your background was in um, politics, in terms of helping to gather data, I know with my students sometimes it's a little overwhelming to look at all these numbers and make sense of it. Um, what was it like for you to go into that territory, being that you're unfamiliar with it? Yes, it was. It was very daunting, and um, uh, your your students are already you know better equipped to do it than, than, than I was, and to read um, a lot of these scientific papers that were um, in, in, in some cases impenetrable to me. <laughs> um, but once again, that's, that's the advantage of being, a, of being a reporter. You can ask people to explain things to you, and, and generally they will. That's good to know. <laughs> um, one of the places that really struck me when I read the book was about One Tree, one tree Island and the remoteness of it. Um, would you mind just describing that in person? You know, what was it like? Because you write about it in a very romantic way. Um, but there was a lot of, for lack of a better word, sad data that you were collecting there. Yeah, so One Tree Island um, is, a, is an island, it's actually part of the reef. You know, the reef, the Great Barrier Reef is, is about 1,500 miles long and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a continuous reef. It's, it's reefs, many, many hundreds of reefs and One Tree Island is a reef that for whatever reason, probably during a storm, at some point a very, very fierce storm, just sort of um, this coral rubble just po pokes above the waves. So you're very, you know, you're maybe two feet, you know, above sea level when you're on the island. There's very, there's not much to it at all. Uh, you're basically on the reef. Um, and you can only get there in high tide because it's, the, the reef itself, you know, is very dangerous to take a boat over. Uh, unless it's high tide, and, and even then it's, it's, it's iffy. <laughs> so they only go, come into the island when it's high tide. It's about 12 miles from um, what even would remotely count as civilization. Uh, and um, so, you know, it's a place where groceries are delivered once a week. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, you're really at the, at the end of the world. You feel like you're at the end of the world. And the amazing experience of it was to go out at night. They collected water samples twice a day, and, I went out with them just to have the experience, um, and you would go out at night, and and really, you know, you, you might as well sort of have been, you know, on the moon. You you were absolutely um, on your own at that point. So it was romantic and a, and a, and a little scary, um, but it was amazing to see a horizon with no lights. Uh, something that unfortunately, you know, we we very rarely get to see. Did they assign you any homework? in terms of reading up on stuff so that you understood what you were looking at, what you were following, what you were collecting? Or is it more like, come for the ride and this is what, this is what we're doing and we want you to see it? Well, I, I usually, at the point that I contacted someone, I, I, I try to do my homework. I think doing your homework is a good thing to do. Um, and I, uh, I, if I, before I was gonna you know, go 10,000 miles to, um, to to go out with people, I, I wanted to make sure it was a worthwhile trip. To you know, to be really honest, it was a very practical consideration, and so I, I really wanted to understand what they were, what I was going to see. I, I tried to have a very good 
as good an idea as you can have without getting there of what you're going to find, because you really don't want to find yourself having traveled 10,000 miles not to see anything. Um, and in fact, uh, before I got to One Tree Island, I was, I was supposed to see an experiment that was on another island uh, called Heron Island. Uh, and it, it wasn't completed. It was this apparatus that hadn't been completed. And so I was actually uh, really upset. And that's actually why I went to Andrea Island, because I had come 10,000 miles and, and there was nothing to see. Um, in speaking of the corals, you know, one of the, one of the major themes that you mentioned throughout the book is this notion of ocean acidification, which we mentioned a little earlier. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, what is maybe the top two things that, you know, people should take away as to what's the seriousness behind the implications of the acidification of the oceans? Well, just for, for, for people who are not um, in, in Sophia's class, ocean acidification just <laughs> refers to the fact that a lot of the carbon dioxide that we're emitting is, is absorbed by the oceans. That's just what happens when you dump stuff in the atmosphere, and um, if you dissolve carbon dioxide in water, you get a, an acid, carbonic acid, and so we are acidifying the oceans, and I think that the um, importance of that is, is pretty hard to overstate, and, you know, the takeaway there is that um, if, you know, one of the things that's very clear, and that's already happening, and it's happening in waters around New York, and it's happening in waters off the West Coast, is that things like shellfish, if, you want, if you're someone who raises, you know, likes to eat shellfish, if you're someone who raises shellfish, uh, that's going to be very difficult. Any, any organism that builds a shell is in trouble when you acidify the oceans, and that turns out to be a lot, a lot of creatures. Um, and speaking of ocean acidification, to put it out to the broader picture, uh, for those of you who have a book in front of you on page 108, uh, Betsy, it's the right teacher thing, sorry. Um, in terms of uh, some of the major reasons why the era of Anthropocene, which is the major pres uh, premise of your book, should be noted, uh, changing of land surfaces, rivers have been dammed or diverted, the um, fertilizer being fortified with nitrates and phosphates, fisheries removing, um, you know, a third of the primary productivity, we using most of our freshwater runoff. Is there any one of those five things that you feel kind of supersedes the other? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. So that, that list was devised by, um, comes from a, a paper that introduced this concept that we're living in a new geological uh, epoch called the Anthropocene, which, you know, is the epoch of, of humans, d dominated by humans, as opposed to the geological epoch that, you know, we live in according to the geological time scale, which is the Holocene, which is the time since the last ice age, so about 12,000 years ago. Um, and I think that one of the things that we've, we've learned is that we are actually not all that good at figuring out what uh, is going to be most damaging uh, to the rest of the world. Um, things that we sometimes think uh, intuitively are very dangerous turn out to be not that dangerous for other creatures, and things that we think are relatively benign can turn out to be extremely dangerous, you know, for example, carbon dioxide. So, um, I don't know that I would presume, to be honest, to look at that list and say one of those is more important than the other. I mean, for example, fertilizer, you know, that we put on our lawns and on our crops, uh, we've completely changed what's called the nitrogen cycle. We've completely overwhelmed that, and that's going to have huge uh, ramifications um, that, are, that are hard for us even to predict at this point. How much did you know about this notion of naming a new time era the Anthropocene? Um, do you feel as though it's kind of frustrating that you know there hasn't been any movement to establish it, knowing what you've seen and writing what you wrote? Well, I think it's actually you know very widely disseminated now in the in the scientific world. It, it, it's actually a, a, an interesting scientific question, and it will probably come to some kind of official vote, and it will probably be voted down. I mean, geologists are very uh, loath to add, you know, new epochs to, to the world. Um, 
very quickly. But I think, uh, for example, there's you know there are three scientific journals now uh, on the Anthropocene, so it, it's 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 had a sort of popular success, even if it will never officially you know be adopted by the by the official keepers of the geological times. Um, so if we move beyond the officials and we talk about everyday people, a lot of uh, your audience members here um, are going to be able to vote in the next election. So a lot of uh, the questions that they uh, posed to me to ask to you was in reference to the political landscape. So geologists are one thing to change their mind, but when we talk about politicians, that's a whole other um, scale in which we try to convince them of the anthropogenic effects of climate change. So what do you find to be most frustrating when you listen to the news cycle? Um, again, with your background, you're, you weren't trained in science, but you do know the implications of our actions now. If there's something that, if you, if you had a forum in which you can kind of say, hey, listen up, what would you say? Well, I, I think you can see, you know, the, 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 the polarization of, of even in our political system around, around this, this issue where, you know, it, it, it will be, it will have, you know, one large group of candidates. I don't know who's going to be the Republican nominee. We probably all have a pretty good idea who's going to be the Democrat nominee. And, um, you know, I think it will, it will be a, an issue hovering out there in the campaign, but you really have a lot of candidates out there still um, quite unbelievably and you'd say implausibly um, really, you know, questioning the very fundamental science which all of your students know is really beyond question of climate change. And I was just actually down in Florida where, you know, all of South Florida is, is going to be inundated um, by rising sea levels. That's pretty much a guarantee at this point. And, you know, you have Marco Rubio, you know, denying climate change. So it's, it, it would be hilariously funny uh, if it weren't so scary, you know. Um, so I don't know, uh, you know, those of you who will soon be able to vote, I hope you will uh, make this a voting issue. I think that's what has to happen. This has to be, you know, some people vote on guns and some people have to vote on climate change. Um, many people have to vote on climate change before we're going to see a change uh, in our politics. Uh, what do you find to be the biggest misconception people have about the anthropogenic effects of climate change? Something that um, you feel with maybe a little bit of reading or a little bit of talking to the right people that they could probably correct their thinking, or at least you hope they do. Well, I, I think that the biggest problem, the thing that people have the hardest time getting their heads around, and that is actually unfortunately extremely important, is um, the inertia of the system. So there's already a lot of warming built in that we haven't experienced yet. Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna do my sort of climate spiel right now. Um, but okay, I think, really? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as your students know, that, that we're, not, we're not in a new equilibrium yet. Um, we still have to warm up uh, by quite a bit before even the greenhouse gases we've already emitted uh, before the Earth warms up and sort of catches up with CO2 levels as they currently are. So every year we just make it worse and worse uh, and prolong that process. Um, but I think people need to realize that this, this system, you, you suddenly decide you're going to you know, do something about climate change, it, 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 it's, it, you're still going to be feeling its effects for, for decades and really actually you know, millennia to be, to be honest about it. So it's not something you can just sort of wake up and decide to fix and people really need to understand that. Do you think that if people had maybe um, everyday access to the information, do you think that they would be more compelled to or do you think because as you said the system needs to kind of reset itself for a while that people are so resistant to kind of accept what's reality? Well, I, I don't, I think we have long past the point where we can say access to information is the problem. You know, I, I think that anyone who wants that information, um, it's really pretty readily available. So I think that the, that there's a psychic, psychological barrier here and, you know, many people are working on this, um, but we've created this situation where, you know, we, you can believe in climate change, so you generally can't, you know, believe or not choose to believe or not to believe in sort of basic geophysical reality. Um, but that is the situation we've gotten into, and 
you know, once again, you can talk about the sort of history behind that, um, but until we sort of get out of that situation, I think it, it's still possible to process even, you know, information that you and I might say, well, that's an obvious you know, indicator of climate change as something else. Um, so for those of us, again, uh, for the younger kids here, they were, they were really interested as someone who is a native to Lamarnock and Larchmont. Um, what was your experience like here in the high school in terms of your career trajectory um, to being a journalist and then eventually writing what you do today? Well, I, I as, as Blythe mentioned, I was an editor um, of The Globe. I'm glad to hear The Globe still exists um, because many, many newspapers have gone out of business. So The Globe is, I'm glad to hear The Globe's still publishing. Um, and I think it was, I had a lot of fun. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> How, do you, how often do you publish? Monthly, monthly publishing. Okay, okay, okay. okay. That's, that's pretty much what we did. Um, so, I, I had a lot of fun doing it, and I, 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 I hope you guys do too. And, um, you know, I don't want to say that set my career path, but that definitely, um, you know, it was part of, of wanting to be a journalist. I really liked um, hassling the administration. I hope you're still hassling the administration. Yeah. Are, are you? Yeah. Miss Lane is right there. You can ask her directly. Are they, are they hassling? Yeah. yeah. It's very important. It's very, it's, it's very important. Um, so again, going back to you, the local aspect of things, another thing um, students were really curious about is what do you think that we could do at both a local level and perhaps a state level to um, kind of mitigate climate change effects or things that we kind of can act on a, um, a more proactive level versus reactive level? Well, I mean, it, the obvious you know, thing that we, we need to do is you know, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, as an individual, there are certainly things that you can do. Um, and, you know, those are I, all the ones you guys know about from, you know, AP environmental studies. Uh, you can, you know, drive less, uh, you can fly less, uh, you can eat differently. Um, you can, you know, uh, bike to school, you know, all, all those ways in which if you think about your own personal emissions, you can go online, you can find an emissions, you know, calculator and you'll be horrified uh, what your personal emissions are. Um, and then on a local level, you know, clearly there are ways in which local governments, there's, there's, a, there's a limit to how much power local governments have, but there are zoning, you know, things that, that could be done to sort of, uh, of foster, you know, using less fossil fuels. And on a state level, you know, there's, there's a lot that can be done. And I, I think New York State, I don't want to say they're a leader, but, but there, 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 there is stuff going on um, in terms of trying to promote a, a different energy mix. Um, but all that requires, you know, constant pressure and vigilance. And I guess, I guess what I would say to the students in the audience is, you know, this is an issue um, that I, you know, I, I guarantee you it's not going away in your lifetimes. We've already guaranteed that, right? We've already basically written the scripts for the rest of your lives. Um, so when you are thinking about what you want to do with your career, um, with your life, I think ener energy, you know, where are we going to get the energy of the future? How are we going to make a transition? Are we going to make a transition to, um, you know, a, a, a low carbon future? That is unfortunately, you know, going to still be uh, very much an active area uh, when you guys are, are, are ready to find jobs. So I, I think that's a full employment uh, uh, area uh, for the rest of your lives if you're looking for something to do uh, with your lives. Yeah, I always joke to the kids that if you can find out um, an energy management plan, or if you know how to handle our trash, you would be billionaires. <laughs> yeah, um, and it's curious that you mentioned about doing individual impacts. Students of AP Environmental Science, they've done pledges. So some of us have been opting to use a reusable water bottle. Some of us are hopefully carpooling. In this case, hopefully carpooling here. Um, so it's small things like that, I think, that really do make a difference. <coughs> Um, is there anything in terms of your travels that you saw that you think would be beneficial for us, maybe within New York? I know you're from, you live in Massachusetts. Uh, is there anything in terms of policy or just um, everyday actions that 
and citizens follow that you think could be replicated in some way here? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think that um, if you look at, you know, we, we live in a certain way, and, 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 and unfortunately, you know, Lord Fry and Marinek are, 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 are pretty good examples of that, um, although, you know, we're very fortunate in this part of the world to have a pretty good public transportation system, but, you know, we live spread out, uh, you know, people drive, you know, to school, a lot of you probably, you know, live Maybe, you know, we, we could argue whether you live too far to walk to school, but, you know, you, you don't. And uh, we drive to the store, and we don't really cluster our development. Um, if, you go to, if you go to Europe, you'll find, you know, public transportation is much uh, more, um, you know, it's, it's just what people use, um, although increasingly even they have cars. And, and, and your average European, you know, emits about a half the greenhouse gases that your average American does. So there's lots of policy that we could uh, be implementing to try to encourage uh, a different, you know, a low carbon lifestyle is very difficult. One of the things that we're sort of discovering here in the States is with a very spread out population, uh, continuing to live exactly as we were living before is, 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 is very difficult to reduce your greenhouse gases at the same time, you know, that we drive long distances and live very far apart from each other. So we are either going to have to rethink that, you know, or we're going to um, continue to be spewing a lot of CO2 into the air. Have you found that the more you know, um, the sadder you are <laughs> in terms of uh, how each and every choice can be quite impactful to the larger picture? Uh, so are there things that you have modified in terms of your practices or your choices uh, that make you more mindful of of what you're using and how you're disposing it and your footprint. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a very, unfortunately the numbers, when you know the numbers, it's very, um, it, it does make everything you do um, kind of, your, 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 your self-revulsion um, increases. Um, and, you know, a big one for me, uh, because of, you know, my job and writing this book, and, you know, is I fly places, and that's a, that's a really, um, that's a huge carbon. So, sort of, no matter what I do, you know, I do, we do have solar panels in our house, and we are pretty much a net, you know, zero electricity, but that's, that's really blown away, you know, every time I, I fly. So, the numbers are really hard, it's really hard to get, um, uh, the numbers to go down, um, and, and I, I do know that, unfortunately, from, from bitter personal experience. So yes, the more you know, the more uh, kind of, um, the more you realize how, how hard it is. How's that? Yeah, that's an unfortunate truth. <laughs> um, do you have any plans to follow up with the individual uh, places that you visited? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I was maybe invited back if the guys go back to one tree. I, I might do that. That's great. Um, yeah, that would be great. They're trying to get an NSF grant. Um, but I don't have any, any other plans to, to go um, back. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we're going to open up the forum to uh, general Q&A. So if there's a question. So, yeah. We'd love to take uh, questions. Um, and just speak loudly, and then I'll try to repeat the question so that everyone can hear it. Can you explain, for people who are um, debaters against climate change that are out there, I wonder, for a long time I think people who know the facts thought that it was just the, in their, their commitment to industry, they were beholden to oil and gas or whatever, but there has to be more to it, whether it's a refusal to accept Well, I, I, you know, I certainly don't want to claim any expertise on that, but a, a lot of social scientists have, have looked at that question, at exactly that question. And also, if you look internationally, you know, if you do polling and you say, you know, is, is climate change a big problem? The U.S. does extremely badly, you know, in terms of, uh, I shouldn't say badly, a surprisingly low proportion of the U.S. compared to the rest of the world, countries that we would consider, you know, much less well-educated than we are. So it's clearly not a function of education, or we're not as well-educated, you know, as we'd like to think we are. So um, the question...
question of, of why, it's particularly here in the U.S., it is, a, it is an unusually American phenomenon that this issue has become a political issue as opposed to, you know, a scientific issue. And I think that one of the conclusions that social scientists have reached is it's become part of this whole constellation of, of, of issues about which there's sort of a, a political litmus test at this point. And so if you are sort of part of one political world, one of the entry points into that world is, you know, not believing in climate change. And, you know, many people have talked about this whole way in which we now all live in sort of our own political worlds and we read the media that agree with our political viewpoints and we you know, don't read the media that don't. And so I think that that is, um, that is a big part of it. And, and if you have elected officials out there whom people, you know, people don't think very highly of their elected officials, but they don't necessarily think that they're feeding them absolute, you know, BS on a daily basis. Um, and they're saying, you know, that I, I, I don't see convincing evidence of that. You know, that, that has a big impact, unfortunately. Um, so unfortunately, there, there's a feedback loop here that, that works, I think, um, to reinforce, you know, I don't, I don't need to think about that. It's, 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 you know, it's a liberal plot, yeah, yeah, you know. So I, I, I don't know how you break out of that cycle. And clearly, unfortunately, we have not yet broken out of it. I'm having a little difficulty saying yes, sir. Uh, Well, I, I think it's a very clear and present uh, issue, obviously, here on Long Island Sound, and I haven't looked. There are tools on the web. Anyone can go home uh, and you can plug in. I don't know how finely detailed they are. Um, I've seen tools for Florida where you can go block by block and see exactly what your elevation is, but I suspect you can go pretty, you could, you could, um, you could burrow down pretty deeply into you know the, the Long Island Sound area and find out what elevation you know we're at sitting here at the hummocks we're not very high um, and you know I think that you know clearly the sound is rising I, I once again I don't have the exact data at my fingertips um, but that is absolutely uh, uh, an, an issue you know I think the peculiar problem they have in South Florida uh, is that they're on porous rock which is a somewhat different situation from Larchmont, but I certainly think um, no coastal zone uh, is this an issue that you don't have to think about. And in, in terms of planning for the future, in terms of you know, the sewage plant and Maranac, all those things are going to be impacted uh, by sea level rise. I, I think that's clear. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned in a book on page two hundred and Um, so the question is whether we have, we have too many groups out there actually, um, you know, working on environmental issues. And, and, and that's, a, that's a actually a, a really interesting question. And I, I can't say that I, once again, I can't say that it's something I have any expertise on a, at all. I think all of those groups that you mentioned are, are doing, you know, really good work and they feel that they are contributing something. But whether there's a certain just institutional inertia, you know, we exist, therefore we should continue to exist, um, and duplication of effort, I and duplication of membership, um, I can't really speak to that. It's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, but I do think that all of those groups, you know, they must appeal to people in some slightly different way, otherwise they wouldn't survive, you know, because it's as as anyone in this room knows, the fundraising challenges are huge. Um, so I suspect there's that most of them could point to a good, a good reason why they do exist, as opposed to the other ones. Um, but I, I wouldn't claim to, you know, know, know what that is. Yes. So, 
so, so the question is about de-extinction and, and whether I think that that technology is, is, is going to ever work. Yeah. So, so the de-extinction, um, the idea behind um, de-extinction is that if you had, well, in some cases we have tissue from organisms that are now extinct. Um, for example, the um, Museum of Natural History in, in Manhattan has a big um, frozen tissue bank. Um, a lot of the bats, dead bats, uh, have, you know, are in, are, in, are in tanks of which are nitrogen now, or cell, cells are. And could you then take the, cell, the cells of a, a species that's gone extinct, you know, put them in a, the egg of, you know, a, a living relative of theirs, and, and sort of, you know, bring that species back to life. And um, the book that you alluded to, How to Clone a Mammoth, I think is a very sober, Look by very you know eminent scientists um, at at how difficult that is, and um, I think that the general you know problem is you're never going to get uh, you're never going to get that animal back, and I think it's really an illusion to think that you are because even if you get an animal's genetics, one of the things that we know. You know, is that is that animals are not more than their genetics, right? They're, they learn. Uh, if you're a bird, you know, you learn. If you're a, a mammal, you certainly learn. So the idea that that well, we could afford to let a species go and then, you know, sort of bring it back at some later date, I think, is a is a very dangerous one. I'm having a little difficulty saying yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned. Well, I, I think it's a very clear and present uh, issue, obviously, here on Long Island Sound, and I haven't looked. There are tools on the web. Anyone can go home uh, and you can plug in. I don't know how finely detailed they are. Um, I've seen tools for Florida where you can go block by block and see exactly what your elevation is, but I suspect you can go pretty, you could, you could, um, you could burrow down pretty deeply into you know the, the Long Island Sound area and find out what elevation you know we're at sitting here at the hummocks we're not very high um, and you know I think that you know clearly the sound is rising I, I once again I don't have the exact data at my fingertips um, but that is absolutely uh, uh, an, an issue you know I think the peculiar problem they have in South Florida uh, is that they're on porous rock which is a somewhat different situation from Larchmont, but I certainly think um, no coastal zone uh, is this an issue that you don't have to think about. And in, in terms of planning for the future, in terms of you know, the sewage plant and Maranac, all those things are gonna be impacted uh, by sea level rise. I, I think that's clear. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned in the book on page 242, I think it is, <laughs> about organizations that are terrific around the world, wildlife, going wildlife. I wonder if you analyze many of the other organizations in this paper. If so, what do you think about the like, Sierra Club, the Oregon Club? Do we have too many organizations that are confusing us as to where we should put our emphasis? Um, so the question is whether we have, we have too many groups out there actually, um, you know, working on environmental issues, and, and, and that's, a, that's a actually a, a really interesting question, and I, I can't say that I, once again, I can't say that it's something I have any expertise on a, at all. I think all of those groups that you mentioned are, are doing, you know, really good work, and they feel that they are contributing something, but whether there's a certain just institutional inertia, you know, we exist, therefore we should continue to exist, um, and duplication of effort, I, and duplication of membership, um, I can't really speak to that. It's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, but I do think that all of those groups, you know, they must appeal to people in some slightly different way. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive. You know, because it's as as anyone in this room knows, the fundraising challenges are huge. Um, so I suspect there's that most of them could point to a good, a good reason why they do exist, as opposed to the other ones. Um, but I, I wouldn't claim to you know, know, know what that is. Yes.
So, so the question's about de-extinction and, and whether I think that that technology is, is, is going to ever work. Yeah. So, so the de-extinction, um, the idea behind um, de-extinction is that if you had, well, in some cases we have tissue from organisms that are now extinct. Um, for example, the um, Museum of Natural History in, in Manhattan has a big um, frozen tissue bank. Um, a lot of the bats, dead bats, uh, have, you know, are in are in, are in tanks of which nitrogen now, or cell, cells are. And could you then take the cell the cells of a, a species that's gone extinct, you know, put them in a, the egg of you know a, a, a living relative of theirs, and and sort of you know bring that species back to life. And um, the book that you alluded to, How to Clone a Mammoth, I think is a very sober look by very you know eminent scientists um, at at how difficult that is. And um, I think that the general you know problem is you're never going to get uh, you're never going to get that animal back. And I think it's really an illusion to think that you are because even if you get an animal's genetics, one of the things that we know uh, you know is that is that animals are not more than their genetics, right? They're, they learn. Uh, if you're a bird, you know, you learn. If you're a, a mammal, you certainly learn. So the idea that, that, well, we could afford to let a species go and then, you know, sort of bring it back at some later date, I think is a, is a very dangerous one. Yes. Yes, I, I, I do. I mean, I think that that was a really powerful um, statement that he made. I mean, I, at the end, it was really uh, forceful, I, I think. Um, and I, I think, you know, I'm not Catholic, so I certainly don't want to speak um, for how much weight the, the, the Pope polls these days. Um, but uh, I actually lived last year in Rome, um, and we went to hear the Pope a couple times, and he was a very, very charismatic guy. Um, and I, I think, I think it sets a tone. It sets a certain tone, and, and um, that it's it, he's hard to ignore. How's that? I, and I hope I hope that's the case. One last question. Um, yes. Right. So the, the question is whether I actually believe that that, he, that humans, the difference between humans and other, you know, human species. I mean, uh, when scientists speak about humans, you know, they don't just speak about us humans. There are many, there are many human species. We just are the only ones around right now. Um, and uh, and and one of the scientists that I interviewed attributes that um, the difference between us and the Neanderthals. He, he called it the madness gene, but he was kind of joking. I mean, that was sort of a metaphor for, you know, what is probably a suite of genetic changes that distinguished us from Neanderthals and that made us much, much more technologically, you know, adept. Somehow we have developed technologies uh, that really changed the world um, and the Neanderthals never did, although they had technologies, you know, they had weaponry, certainly. Um, they just never sort of took that next world dominating <laughs> step. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting question. I mean, what are those, what, what is it? What, what's the difference between us and other, you know, very, very smart, able, you know, what's the difference really between us and apes? Um, and I, I think it's a, a very serious and interesting question now, and, and, and it's a very um, profound question because we are actually in the process of killing off all of the other great apes on the planet right now. Uh, our very closest relatives. We already killed off some of our closest relatives. And, uh, you know, so what does it mean to be a human? I mean, it's really, really, uh, and, and, and it's also at precisely this moment that we're learning so much more 
about other hominid species. So it's a really fascinating uh, time for that, to be asking that question. And on that note, I'm gonna urge all of you to hug each other when you leave, so. <laughs> Um, I want to thank both of you so much. Uh,